Hello everyone. I thought I'd show you uh, one of my very favorite tools. And the reason for it is because it can do so much. And I, I gave an overview last week on the air compressor and today I'd like to just go a little bit more in depth and show you how to use it. Um, let, let's just start off. This is a small, small tank. The larger the compressor, uh, the larger the tank and the faster you can uh, refill that tank. And that would allow you to use uh, air grinders, paint sprayers, and this and that. What I'm going to show you is how I use a small little tank. This is more or less for like a homeowner or a, a trim carpenter. But you can do an awful lot with a tank like this. So the very first thing that I want to show you is there's two gauges on the front. The first one is the amount of air in the tank itself. Okay. The second gauge is the regulator. That's how much air pressure is coming out of this nozzle right here where our hose is going to be connected. And you don't have any say really on how much air is in the tank, but you definitely control how much comes out of the tank with this little red knob here. And I'll be going over that in a moment. All right. On the back of the tank is this little peacock right here. And every time I use one of these, I don't want moisture. Uh, when air is compressed, it creates moisture. I don't want that running through the lines and into my guns. So what I like to do is when I start it up, every time I'll do this and I'll let the air run in here for a minute or two until all the moisture stops coming out of the bottom. Then I'll close it off and I'll let the, the tank fill up. Get into the habit of doing that. After every use, let all the air out, unplug it, let all the air out of the tank, and uh, your tank won't rust out that way. You get a long, long life out of your compressor. The last thing I want to show you before we start this noisy thing up, well, there's two things. This is an emergency stop. You just push that in and everything will stop. And this is the safety release valve. If too much air gets into this tank, too much pressure, this will automatically blow and uh, release the, the pressure in your tank. Okay, that being said, let's, let's do this thing. All right, this again is the pressure in the tank. And right now we're reading about 150 PSI. On this one, this is the regulator side. This tells me how much is gonna come out of the line. And I adjust that with this red knob. So right now you can see we're at about 120 PSI. And can you see how I'm moving that dial? That's how much is going to come out of my line. So let's start. Let's just start right there to show you what I'm talking about. That's very, very little. That's about 20 PSI. Now I would use that when I'm going to use something like this spraying mantis. This is for, again, applying texture to a wall in an apartment or a uh, hotel room something that has gotten a lot of abuse moving things in and out um, it freshens it up and i'll show you real quick 
I'm not going to spray a wall, but it's super simple. You again would uh, take the mud that you have, your sheetrock mud, and add a lot of water to it. Mix it up with your, your paddle wheel and your uh, heavy duty drill. And when you get it to a, a consistency that's just between uh, wet paint and uh, pancake batter, step back about two feet and you would spray it at 20 PSI. And that'll give you a splattering on the wall. You let it dry in a couple hours, you can paint it. And this is what it would look like. This is the side that goes into the air chuck side. See that? I like to undo my hoses prior to uh, hooking them up, by the way. This is just for demonstration purposes. This side would go in here. Okay. And I have a valve right here. So I would turn that on. Okay. And I'd go, and that 20 PSI, which is super low on this machine, would start spitting the mud onto that wall. Stand two feet back and go left and right, just like that. Or up and down a great way to freshen up a room all right let's turn this up a little bit I normally run about 120 okay so my dial would say 120 and I thought I'd show you where safety glasses some of the applications that I use this is a brad gun and as you can see there's a magnetic strip here and you just stick this right in there and you can use different size brads. This is my Porter cable brad guns and I've got one and a quarter inch right here. I've got five eighths. I've got a bunch of different sizes and it works the same way. See that? So depending on what I'm going to be uh, attaching determines what size fastener I'm going to use. So I'll just give you an example. Again, it's a gun, so make sure you don't point it at anybody. That's how you attach it. You just pull this back. And then push it forward. Okay. Let's pretend that we're going to attach some kind of a molding like this just to anything. Okay, I'm going to attach that. Normally I'd put a little glue on this, but this is just for fun what I'm, I'm going to show you. And I'd go to a little bit of a meaty section. And you got to just push down on that nose piece and squeeze the trigger. See how easy that is? It does a wonderful job. And of course, that's attached.
Very nice. This is an oilless gun. That's something that we should talk about. You have to find out what type of guns you're running. Some require uh, putting air tool oil into this little nozzle right here. I, I like to do it every time I use the gun or every other time I use the gun. And you can tell when it needs it because the gun won't have as much strength. Okay, won't tighten down a bolt as quick or as well. So you just drop two or three little droplets of oil right in this, this hole and you're good to run. They don't like to use it on bread guns and finish guns because they don't want, if you put oil in this gun, it's going to come out eventually the nozzle and that'll ruin the finish on trim pieces. So that's kind of a, a rule of thumb. You know that you're not going to be putting oil in bread guns and finish guns. I'll just shoot a couple of these. This is an angled finish gun, 15 gauge, and it works just like all the other guns. You pull back on this. and you press and just like that you've driven these I don't know one and a half inch fasteners right into that that's this is the gun that I use for heavy-duty trim door casings and that kind of thing large crown and then I'll fill in the holes with wood putty Okay, let's talk about the palm gun for a moment. This is the type of gun you would use when you're confined in tight spaces that you can't fit a large gun into. All you do is you take your nail and you put it in just like that. And I'll show you what I mean. Let's connect it. Okay. Put this in it like that. And then when you push down on it, can you see how I'm driving that right in with this? How's that? Is that fantastic? This is a very handy gun. I never did show you when you're how you put nails in these guns. They come in different configurations. Don't mix up your nails with your guns. For example, this is a Pazload gun. I use Pazload nails. I don't buy generic nails for any of my guns. And then you just I was gonna show you that, wasn't I? Have it pointed down, slide it in that channel, and boom. Okay. Again, never point the gun at anybody. I really like these little air nozzles. Why are they handy? Quick way to dust off my tools. Let me lower that a little bit. See this pile of dust right here? Really handy to keep a few of these around in many different locations. All right. These are my mechanic tools, and I'll show you how convenient they are. This is an impact gun. Hooks up just like all the other ones. Okay, right here. Drop a few droplets of oil every time or every other time you use it. On this particular gun, you'll see the forward and reverse. 
That would be reverse. That would be forward. And you use impact sockets for impact guns. And the reason is these are the chrome ones and they're used for ratchets. These are hardened, okay? And these are of a softer metal. And if you use chrome sockets on impact guns, they're more likely to break, but that's not the reason that you don't want to use them. You want to use the softer one, the softer metal, because there's a hammer in this, and it'll actually destroy or wear out the hammer quicker with a chrome socket than with an air impact. So these are the sockets that you would use. They're always black. And these, again, the chrome ones are for ratchets. An air ratchet. Air impact. Use this for like taking off uh, flywheel bolts or uh, lawnmower bolts or lug nuts. All right, I, just for giggles and kicks, I have a scrap lawnmower something that you'd find on the side of the road or a scrap man might have one, you pick it up. The first thing you do before you touch a lawnmower or really any power equipment that you're going to reach around that something could cut fingers off, disconnect the spark plug just like that. Next thing is always tip the side that has the carburetor up. So we're going to do that. So I'd be like that. Okay. This is a 9 uh, bolt right here, and if it has a lot of stuff around it, take a wire brush so that you don't uh, round it over. And watch how handy these are. Just put it up like that, have it on reverse, and just like that, I was able to remove a bad lawnmower blade. All right. Just reinstall that and you always want to kind of hand tighten them to get them started okay put it on forward so you push it like that watch your watch your fingers And there you go. Okay, let me show you how I remove a flywheel with an impact gun and an air chisel. Uh, you would do this if your blade hit maybe a stump in the ground and you might have uh, sheared off your flywheel key. You remove the three bolts that hold on the blower housing. Okay. Then you zip off the bolt holding on the flywheel. <laughs> See how easy that was? And right here is your flywheel key. And boy, this one's sheared actually. Isn't that funny? Fits right in this groove. And uh, I'll show you how to how to pop that off.
be using downward pressure on this pry bar and the flywheel and the air chisel. And just like that, it pops up. All right, I've got one last thing to show you. Oh, let me show you what I meant. Can you see how that got sheared? It's a soft metal, and it's meant to be destroyed if you hit something with a lawnmower. This obviously was hit, <laughs> or hit something. All right, so that would need replacing. So the last thing I want to talk about is airing the tires. Uh, wheelbarrows, dollies, uh, my final saw, even a vehicle or a lawn tractor. I'm going to show you a decal on the car door or a car jam. That's going to tell you what you should inflate your tires in a vehicle for. The tire is going to state one thing, but the manufacturer is going to tell you what they would like all the tires to be at. I'll, I'll give you an example. On the Hyundai, I believe the tires say 45 PSI. Don't quote me, but I think that's what it says. But in the car, you know, on the jam, on the sticker, it says 30 PSI. That's what they want all their tires done at. You know, I'll, I'll put a picture in, in, the, uh, in the video. You see this little knot right here? This is a, a tire gauge. And the way it works is you push it in. And it comes out and it tells you, right there, we've got about 12 PSI in this tire. Do it again. And again, 12 PSI. But say uh, we overinflated it. You take that little divot right there, and you push in, and it lets air out. And now we're going to inflate it with one of these. And this end has the same fitting on the end. And it's used for like a dually, uh, one of those larger trucks with the two tires on the back, so that you can get in, or a large tractor, or like a school bus. They would have a, uh, a valve stem that you can get access to by pulling instead of pushing. Just a different way to go. Okay? So what we do is just push it in. Sometimes you want to hold it. These small tires don't take much. All right, everyone. You've seen how I use my air compressor and all the little attachments that I have for it. As you can tell, it's very handy to have one, and you can do a lot with one. I'll catch you on the next one.